that's an old photo. I, I was better looking back then, maybe. Um, so th thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Eric Basic. I am a designer and a recovering architect. Uh, I was going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, smart cities. Um, I don't have the clicker, actually, to advance slides. <laughs> Do we have the remote? Is it on stage here? Ah, OK. Great. Um, well, I think I went right to the end. Yeah, I think that's doing it. OK. I'm all set. <laughs> you can do it backwards. That'd be more interesting. Uh, so, so what is a smart city? I think this is a great question to start with. Um, and I like to think of it as this kind of interesting layer of, of sensors and actuators that are rapidly blanketing our cities around the world. Um, and what they're doing is it's really anything that can collect or, or throw off information. And so this could be things like cell phones in your pockets. It could be city buses. Um, it could be solar-powered trash compactors. It could be Internet of Things connected mesh networks. Anything that's really storing information. Um, and what is that information used for? How is it useful? So that information can be used to um, either in increase the efficiency or the optimization of energy or utilities in existing urban infrastructure, so helping to improve what is already existing in the cities. Um, the second thing it's also really good for is citizen engagement, so giving people an opportunity to actually be more involved in the city, giving people tools like um, cell phone apps where they can uh, take pictures of burnt out light bulbs, let's say, in city or public spaces and enable uh, maintenance crews to go out and fix them more, more readily. And the third thing it's really good for is long-term um, urban investment and being able to use more evidence-based information for decision-making and for investment opportunities as opposed to just purely relying on political will. Um, and I need to be completely transparent. I stole this slide from uh, Professor Carlo Ratti, who is uh, at MIT. He runs a group called the Sensible City Lab. And I was lucky enough to be able to work with him for a number of years. And so I'm going to go and talk about a couple of projects we did together uh, in that time. And then I'll talk about some of my more recent work at Sidewalk Labs. So the first project I want to talk about is uh, Real Time Rome. And this is um, one we did with Telecom Italia back in 2006. So this is in an age before uh, the smartphone, if you can remember back that far. And what this was is actually one of the first visualizations of uh, geospatial call records shown over a map. And so this is really our first window into what the digital landscape looked like over top of cities. Uh, and this was call record information we took from the World Cup final in 2006. That was a famous game when uh, Zidane headbutted <laughs> the Italian player and got sent off and cost France the World Cup final. And obviously, that generated quite a lot of call activity <laughs> uh, after the game. A more recent example is one called HubCab. And for this one, we took 170 million trip data logs from across New York City. This is all five boroughs. And it's taxi pickup locations and taxi drop-off locations. And we made it into a beautiful interactive visualization. But um, more importantly, what we did was analyze the information and find out that there was these massive migrations happening across the city, where clusters of people were starting in one place and all ending up in second place, all taking individual taxis to get from one place to the next. And we thought, well, what if we could just consolidate these trips? What if people could actually share the rides? And instead of taking four different taxi cabs across town, they could all share one and take one cab across town. This would save a lot of fuel. It would cut down on emissions, and it would reduce traffic congestion. And so we wrote a white paper about it that actually was a precursor to Uber Pool, which is the on-demand ride-sharing service that a lot of cities are now adopting. I heard yesterday that 20% of Uber's trips in San Francisco are Uber Pool trips. So that's a huge reduction in total of vehicle miles traveled in a city uh, that we're seeing in just a, sh a few short years. Next one I want to talk about is called Trash Track. This is a project uh, we did in 2009 in partnership with Waste Management. And instead of using other people's data sets and analyzing and visualizing them in interesting ways, this time we actually had the opportunity to create our own data set. So we developed this GPS sensor that we tagged onto trash items. So we invited people from all over Seattle to come in and bring their trash. So things like old tires, old shoes, printer cartridges, monitors, coffee cans, whatever they were trying to throw out. Uh, and we tagged it, and we sent them home and told them to dispose of it as they normally would. And the result was actually quite astounding. We watched these objects move across the city and then across the state and eventually across the country and back again. 
And this is a really fascinating view into the life of waste, because so much of our energy and thinking goes into supply chain management, thinking about um, the logistics and the coming together of things and manufacturing, but we don't really think so much what happens to them at end of life and where they go um, once their functional life is over. And so based on this analysis, um, the folks at Waste Management started rethinking some of their practices and recycling, uh, especially with e-waste. So that was a, a massive implication in cutting down on the carbon and energy associated with moving trash <laughs> across the entire country. The last one I'll talk about is a project called the Copenhagen Wheel. This is in partnership with the city of Copenhagen, and we're aiming to increase bicycle ridership in Copenhagen. And if any of you have been to Copenhagen, which I'm sure most of you have, there's a massive amount of bike riding uh, happening there already. I think over 50% of adults use bicycles as a way to get to work or school already. But the city was like, why, why isn't this more like 100%? And so we're like, OK. So we developed this uh, wheel, which goes on the back of any standard bike and converts into an electric hybrid. So it has an internal motor and a set of batteries. And there's nothing external. So you just put this hub on and connect to it with your smartphone. And it enables you to augment your efforts. So the amount of pedal power you apply to the wheels gets added by the uh, hub in the back. So you can traverse larger distances or get to work without being so sweaty or climb hills you weren't able to climb previously. So this is an important tool for increasing bike ridership. But what we also did was included an air quality monitor and a sensor in it. So we could actually also help create a real-time air quality map of the city that could be used to help people make more intelligent quick decisions. So they could take routes that were less polluted or had less contaminants in them, and also help the city make planning to um, produce bicycle infrastructure and laneways that were more conducive for riding. So after a number of years in, uh, in, the, ac in the academic community, I decided to change pace a little bit. I worked as a consultant for a while, and then ended up at Google. And while at Google, I got mixed up with this group that was really excited about urban innovation and urban mobility and really thinking the way cities could be um, conceived of and imagined. And so we started a group called Sidewalk Labs, which has now uh, developed into a sister company in Alphabet very recently. So it's like Google or Google X or Google Ventures or Nest. It's one of the companies that are underneath this Alphabet umbrella. <coughs> and so the goal of Sidewalk Labs is really to become a platform for urban innovation. We want to leverage the capabilities and ex expertise, data analytics, and and community relationships that Google and other companies in the Alphabet family have established, and really apply that to the urban problem. So why is this important? We really think that digital technology is creating the, uh, the next wave of, of urban revolution um, driven by technology. We can think about things like the steam engine or electricity, the electric light, automobiles or the elevator, and what profound impacts that they had on the built environment and the way we understand and experience and navigate the cities. And we think that digital technologies are going to have an equally impactful uh, transformation on the urban realm. But one of the barriers to change is the lack of dialogue between people who live in today's cities and those who are building the technologies for tomorrow in the city. And so we really wanted to facilitate that conversation and make it easier for people to share information and understand what the needs are. <clears throat> Our goal is really to create higher quality life for citizens in cities, make them more efficient and more effective, as well as creating new business opportunities. So this is like a very um, for-profit business we're trying to run. It's not a purely philanthropic wing of Google that's trying to donate money to cities. We're trying to make businesses here. So this is an interesting fact. Given New York City is like one of the major economic hubs of the world, um, it's fascinating to think that 36% of New York households below the poverty line don't have access to internet at home. And that's kind of an amazing statistic based on Marcelo's conversation yesterday about connectivity being uh, a human right. Uh, in a highly productive place in the West, to have such a low rate of internet connectivity is actually quite appalling. If you look at a map of New York City, you can kind of see that this access follows lines that you might expect, you know, richer parts of the city like Manhattan with Wall Street and uh, Fifth Avenue and all the expensive real estate and shops has a very high rate of connectivity, whereas places like uh, South Brooklyn here, Coney Island or the Bronx have much less internet penetration. And so we wanted to think what we could do about that to help alleviate this problem and to make the internet more accessible to more people across Manhattan and New York City. Um, and so what we looked at was the old payphone. This is an existing infrastructure that existed all across the entire city, um, but it was completely disused and underutilized. And um, we wanted to think how this could be rethought. 
the interesting part was there was a lot of interesting uh, existing infrastructure already in place, and so we could use that same infrastructure and reinvent the payphone of the future. So what we did was this project called Link, which is an internet kiosk. It's a hotspot that produces gigabit Wi-Fi, and it's replacing all of those payphones in New York City. So what it does is it has ultra-fast gigabit Wi-Fi, so you can actually download movies like on your way into the subway in a few seconds, which is pretty remarkable. It's completely free. Um, it has local search and wayfinding and listings, so if you're trying to get somewhere and your phone is dead, you can not only charge your phone at the kiosk, you can also do search um, on the display. It also has the opportunity for emergency and civic services, so if you need to call 911 to report something, or there's this really famous program of see something, say something in New York City for terrorist uh, visibility, I think this is also a great opportunity for that. So we're going to replace up to 10,000 locations across the five boroughs. We've deployed, I think, over 700 already, so we're well underway. Um, it's collecting a ton of data and generating a lot of revenue already, and so we're excited to see the rollout expand across the entire New York City. And the goal is for this to be present in every neighborhood, kind of be this uh, urban infrastructure that people kind of forget wasn't always there. Again, this is a great opportunity to access uh, civic services and help with wayfinding. And really the goal for both residents and visitors is to uh, improve equity, to make the internet and connectivity more available to more folks, to drive engagement, add revenue, and increase um, digital city services, so things like 311, emergency calling, uh, and the civic engagement kind of work that I was talking about earlier. So, so far the public reaction has been very positive in this space, over 90% approval rating. Uh, I think that a lot of people think that Link is a, is a good thing and a positive attribute to add to New York City, so that's, that's great to see. But for me, I think the most relevant part and the most interesting part, perhaps, is the enablement of this age of intelligent environments, the idea that we could live in a city that actually responds dynamically to the changing needs of the users, both individuals and over time. And so to me, I think this is really what Sidewalk Labs was designed to do. I think the Link NYC is an interesting first step, but we're very excited to see how many more steps we can take this to improve equity and, um, and opportunities for people in cities and be able to create intelligent environments that really help people live more sustainably and, um, and create new opportunities for, for cities. So thank you very much. <laughs>